The fifth Bioceuticals Research Symposium will be held from the 21st to the 23rd of April 2017 in Sydney. This promises to be another sellout event. For more information, including registration, go to the Education tab at bioceuticals.com.au. FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. Joining me on the line today is Sean Hessler, Divisional Director of Community Health at SCNM and Executive Director of Naturopaths Without Borders. Dr. Hessler has always been committed to global and community health throughout his education, and upon graduating in 2010, he co founded the Mama Baby Haiti Birth Center in Cap Haitan, Haiti. Forgive my pronunciation if it's wrong. He's the recipient of the SCNM Alumni Award for Community Service, and he's spoken and written about global health since beginning at SCNM in 2006. Now steering SCNM's eight community clinics and expanding SCNM's role in community health, Dr. Sean has also taught medical students didactically at SCNM and clinically at Adelante Healthcare, as well as the NWB sites in um, Haiti, Mexico and Phoenix. Dr. Sean has chosen to dedicate his life to global naturopathic medicine, striving to bridge the gap between naturopathic physicians and students and underserved communities worldwide. Dr. Sean Hessler, welcome to FX Medicine. How are you? I am great. Thanks for having me. Our absolute pleasure. Now, I've got to ask, firstly, like in Australia where FX Medicine's based and approximately 60 to 70% of our audience comes from, naturopathy is still considered an unregistered health profession. Can you take us through the lay of the land of naturopathy in the USA? Where does it sit? Absolutely. So right now we have, uh, to my knowledge, I think 17 um, states and territories where we are licensed as doctors or physicians. So just like your conventional, um, you know, your conventional medical doctors, we can do physical exams, order laboratory testing and diagnostic testing, prescribe medications as needed. Uh, we're trained to do minor surgical procedures as well as you know, the spectrum of naturopathic care that we are trained to offer, clinical nutrition, botanical medicine, homeopathy, um, and as well as physical manipulation like chiropractors. Um, at SCNM, we're also trained in acupuncture. Oh, okay. And that is also the case with the two Canadian colleges as well. Um, and in Arizona and Connecticut, we can actually do acupuncture with our license. So um, what your scope of practice looks like depends on which state you're in. We have a very broad scope here in Arizona. So in addition to the things that I said, we can prescribe medications up to Schedule 3, including hydrocodone and morphine. Um, we can prescribe medical marijuana in the state of Arizona, and we can do some aesthetics, aesthetics procedures as well. Ah. So uh, in some states where we're not regulated, um, NDs work as more of kind of health coaches or you know, nutritional botanical consultants. So they may or may not be able to you know, touch their clients. Um, but, you know, one day we hope that we will have all of the state's license. Um, you know, the, the ANP is doing a really great job working with the state associations to make that happen. And um, what about the minor surgical procedures? What sort of things are we talking about here? Um, you know, minor skin cancers or even up to melanomas, or are we talking minor wounds? Um, so technically we are, we are not able to treat cancer. Um, so if there is, you know, melanoma, for instance, we won't remove that, but just about everything else that's skin deep. So, you know, ingrown toenails, lipomas, um, we're doing biopsies for diagnosis. Uh, and then again, in Arizona, we, Arizona, we could do aesthetic procedures, such as Botox and microdermabrasion and chemical peels and things like that. 
So, uh, so basic wound care is, is definitely covered in that scope of practice. And again, it depends on which state you're in, uh, et cetera, but, you know, st- stitching up wounds and, uh, you know, removing minor things like separated keratoses is within our scope in Arizona and several other states. Gotcha. And, and how is naturopathy viewed, particularly, I guess, by the, the orthodox medical model? Um, in the US, you know, there's still a lot of um, controversy here, and I, I'll just say it blankly, unacceptance. Um, you know, and and the the term that's bandied around here by you know friends of science in medicine is the, the pseudoscience, um, with the the quip basically if it have en- if it had enough evidence, it would be medicine, not alternative medicine or complementary medicine. Um, I'm I'm my way of if you like practicing or viewing this is. Uh, being a registered nurse, I'm not alternative. I'm more complementary or integrative. Some people dislike that term as well. They just say, well, it should be supportive medicine, but it's still medicine. How do you view that? I, I still right. see a little bit of sort of arrogance there, if you like. <laughs> it's ours, you know, the turf war. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's definitely here as well. Um, I think the conversation is a bit different because of our training as primary care physicians here. So, um, you know, we were able to do, you know, quote unquote, I say this tongue in cheek, real medicine, um, as well as the more natural holistic side as well. So I actually see us kind of bridging the gap between the two communities. Um, we're able to speak both languages and, you know, kind of interpret what's happening on the natural side with conventional science and to use conventional therapeutics when necessary. Mm. Uh, and that's up to the practitioner and, and obviously to the patient to have a discussion you know, as to when that happens. But um, I will say that acceptance is definitely increasing. And as we work closer with our conventional colleagues, you know, both MDs, DOs, nurse practitioners, PAs, uh, and definitely RNs, um, the bridges are definitely being built. And yeah. so, uh, you know, in my decade of naturopathic medicine, I have definitely seen this improve. And uh, where I work with uh, with SCNM, I run a shift at a federally qualified health center called Adelante Healthcare. So after the passage of the Affordable Care Act, there were some federal federally uh, subsidized facilities that opened in order to provide care in areas where there wasn't access to care um, or for patients who are underinsured. And so we actually have a shift where uh, MDs will refer patients to us. And so just through seeing how we deal with um, how we deal with the patients who come to us, how we approach their cases, the treatments we're using, and the success that we're getting, that is also building a bridge. Another example is um, Phoenix Allies for Community Health, which is an all-volunteer free clinic. It's primarily run by PAs and nurses. Naturopath at Borders has had a presence there for about two years, and we work alongside them at the same table so we can actually collaborate in real time on the patients that we're seeing. And so our students get to see more of the conventional side and learn to speed up their diagnosis and improve the knowledge of pharmaceuticals. Um, and the PAs and the nurses on the other side um, see how we are approaching patients differently, treating them a little bit different way and using different therapeutics. And they're also getting a better mindset for when uh, and where they might want to refer patients. Maybe they're not getting better with the conventional care, especially for chronic disease, or maybe their patients are asking for it and they don't know how to speak to it. And now that we've had experience working side by side, it's definitely changing the mindset. Right. I have to uh, um, say first, I've mentioned SCNM quite a few times, particularly in your bio. You've mentioned it as well as Adelante Healthcare. Can you please explain what SCNM is for our listeners? Yes, SCNM is short for Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine. It is one of the accredited naturopathic schools, uh, four-year medical schools in the United States and Canada, which will graduate uh, and prepare students for boards who can then become licensed naturopathic physicians. So um, you know, some other schools are NUNM, Bridgeport, NUHS, Best Year, CCNM, Boucher. Um, there's also a couple different schools in development. There's a school in Puerto Rico also, um, Turabo. Yeah. 
And um, so any of these schools can uh, will graduate um, students with an NV who can then um, sit for the board exam and potentially become licensed. Right. And moving on to Naturopaths Without Borders, because I think this is the the – I've got to say, it's glorious what you're doing. It, it re- like I really take my hat off to you. What you're doing for underdeveloped nations and you know those people that can't afford or get access to proper healthcare. So, can you take our listeners through how did Naturopaths Without Borders (NWB) form and develop? Absolutely. So NWB actually um, started at SCM as a student organization there was a need with SNM's new community clinics um, for students to learn and practice medical Spanish. There is a large Spanish-speaking uh, population here yeah. in Arizona. Yep. Um, you know, the lang- obviously, a language barrier is going to be a barrier to care. Mm. So there was a, an organization uh, or a student club really called Club Medico that formed in 2003 in order to help meet that need. They decided to... You know, add a more service aspect, a more international service aspect to it. In 2004, it became Naturopaths Without Borders. So in 2010, we added two new student chapters, and in 2011, actually incorporated, made it you know, a 501c3 American nonprofit organization and um, began full-time operations in Haiti. Uh, as well as in 2006, we started doing monthly trips to Puerto Penasco, Mexico, um, to help the community there. And then we added Patch two years ago um, to help the community here in Phoenix. And we've also been doing some work lately with um, Haitian refugees that are coming through Phoenix as well, just you know, helping with interpretation and you know, helping to connect them with resources. Right. So how did you go from learning like a medical Spanish to dialoguing with Haitian people who have is it a Creole? Is it French? What what's what's the major language that you encountered there? Right. So actually, the organization was founded before I started as a student at SCNM. Uh-huh. And so um, when I came in, I it was actually one of the the main reasons why I started at SCNM in the first place. Um, I I became involved very quickly and took on a leadership role very quickly. Um, we didn't know exactly when we would end up in Haiti, but we thought at some point we would. Mm. Um, and we've, we've gone where we were asked. And so there was a midwifery organization called Mama Baby International that was looking to start a birth center in Haiti. And so my wife and I right. decided to do it soon after we graduated. And, uh, that was how we got our start. So. My initial inspiration for wanting to go to Haiti was because I read a book called Mountains Beyond Mountains, which is about um, a physician and medical anthropologist named Paul Farmer. Mm. Um, That book was a major inspiration for me, and then I read all of Paul Farmer's books after that. Um, So I was already kind of fascinated with um, the the history and the culture of the country, and I wanted to experience it. And I, I thought that the skills that we bring to the table and the, the knowledge that we have gleaned from thousands of years of different cultural medical practices I thought would be useful in Haiti. Um, our view on, on how we work with communities, our view on aid work has definitely evolved mm. since we started. Um, but you know, ultimately working alongside Haitians, a combination of our expertise uh, their expertise and their their desire, you know, to uh, to improve the health of their communities is is what moves us forward. Yeah. Um, so mountains beyond mountains. I'll put that um, that book up on our on the FX Medicine website for our listeners to access. What interests me though is that there's not just a language barrier. Oftentimes, there's a cultural barrier. And, and even, for instance, we see this in Australia with the, our Indigenous population, a, a trust versus mistrust thing with, you know, Western-style medicine. How does naturopathic medicine transcend that? Right. So uh, to answer your previous question, uh, Haitian Creole is a Creole language, which means it's a kind of mixed 
language yeah. of French and some indigenous African languages from uh-huh. when these slaves were taken, uh, kidnapped really from Africa and brought over to be slaves in Haiti. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's uh, similarities structurally, uh, you know, vocabulary is similar to French, but uh, it is a bit different. So people who speak French can pick it up pretty quickly. They can, they can understand it pretty well. Although um, everybody in Haiti speaks Creole, not everybody speaks French. So it, linguistic barrier is one thing, but yes, the culture is, is different, um, you know, than what we're used to in the United States. Um, one way to bridge that gap is to immediately dialogue with the country uh, that, that you're going to work with and ideally have some people to guide you along the way. Um, but more or less, the more you put yourself in a position of support and trying to build capacity of what's already going on to the ground, other grassroots organizations, ideally uh, organizations from that country, um, the more that, that you're there to help and not kind of create a parallel system or kind of clash with what's going on, mm. um, the easier. So uh, we have patient health workers who actually go out and do the bulk of the educational work. Um, and then when we have volunteers come, for instance, they work alongside them. And it's as much uh, volunteers serving as much as they're learning mm. about Haiti, Haiti's culture, about Haiti's medicine, the, the plants, the foods that are available, learning how to apply the naturopathic principles, regardless of what type of volunteer it is. So it's not so much um, that we are going there to save them or that there's something kind of inherently wrong with the culture. There's just been so much intervention that uh, ill-intentioned or well-intentioned has has served to uh, kind of railroad Haiti's own efforts to develop itself. Right. So we'd like to... You know, part of the solution to the problem. So, um, in terms of naturopathic medicine, because it's actually a blend of medicine from various cultures over the centuries, it actually works very well to bridge the gap, as I said, between conventional care and the local Haitian herbalists, for instance. Yeah. There's a lot of traditional herbal medicine use in Haiti, and our ability to speak that language, to actually learn about Haitian herbs and then help to facilitate kind of the relearning of that knowledge um, really builds bridges culturally yeah. and with each individual patient. So I'm going to ask a, a devil's advocate question, uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm sort of standing on the side of the, the naysayer to natural medicine here, and, and that would be, well, if natural medicine's working and it's got something to offer, how come these people are so ill? How come these people are so impoverished and, and uh, need the help that you're supplying? How would you answer that? couple of things are going on. Um, number one, the conventional model of care has significant issues in the United States itself, which is kind of coinciding with the re-emergence of natural therapies in the mainstream consciousness. So even though naturopathic medicine has been around for over 100 years in the United States, it went away after a while with you know, the discovery of penicillin and other kind of miracle drugs. And now that we're facing more chronic disease, um, conventional care is less well-equipped to handle that. Um, and natural care is quite well-equipped to handle that. So that's one side of it, that Haiti is also adopting, um, you know, the American medical system is kind of, you know, importing it with its strengths and weaknesses. There's also a loss of knowledge of the plants around them of food as medicine, for instance, um, it's not a complete loss. Most people that we work with know a handful of herbs and a few uses for them. Um, so what we instead focus on is improving their knowledge of their own plants, both the number of plants and also different uses for those plants. Um, nutrition as well. There is, because of the rampant um, poverty and food dumping by foreign countries. Um, Haiti's own food production is limited. There's a limited variety of foods. Um, and so it's harder for them to get the right 
balance of macronutrients, micronutrients, and phytonutrients that they need in order to be healthy. So in helping um, patients make more informed choices about the foods they're eating and to make better economic choices about them um, and about really the dangers of imported food, the dangers of the processed sugar uh, that is you know, being very inexpensively dumped upon them, um, they're able to make healthier choices for themselves. Um, massage is also very big in Haiti, and we actually have sponsored an infant massage training program. Yeah. So there are um, health workers and just lay people who are going to their communities. They've been trained, and they're actually helping to teach infant massage to other families. So again, it's it's not that um, we're trying to kind of replace what's going on um, culturally. We're just kind of trying to augment it. Uh, to things that are already being done, um, you know, but to work with their capacity and our knowledge to help people become healthier. You, you raise a couple of very interesting things there, and to me, it's kind of like, let's say agribusiness. Let's let's term it that agribusiness yeah. almost creates the health problems. If you rec- if you try and introduce any natural medicine, it's blamed for not working, even though the problem was the agribusiness causing it. And so natural medicine almost becomes a scapegoat, <laughs> whereas if they could retain the historical natural medicines that were around, that were traditionally taught, they would have treatments for a lot of, not all, but a lot of their diseases. So with regards to, you know, um, the ba- uh, mama baby program, do you find like major issues with micronutrients that are used commonly here, well, should be used commonly here in Australia, like iodine, do you find that that's a big issue or is it mainly the sort of more B vitamins, folate type vitamins that are used in pregnancy to support successful pregnancies? Right. So um, there has been a little bit of epidemiologic research on um, deficiencies in Haiti. Mm -hmm. Uh, Actually, iodine is a major deficiency. You would think that being... Um, you know, surrounded by, by ocean, mm. that that it wouldn't be a big issue. Um, but actually, people on the whole are not able to afford um, you know a lot of seafood like fish. You know, that would have the iodine. People are not really eating kelp or anything like that. So it is in some of the soil, but um, more and more, the food source is imported. Right. Um, Especially every time there's a disaster, it's it's an opportunity for aid to come in and first go provide some food security so that people are not dying of starvation from the disaster. Yep. But ultimately, it it itself kind of competes with the agriculture of the country itself. Mm. Um, the a particularly egregious example, of, you know, natural consequences as well is Hurricane Matthew that just passed through destroyed a lot of the agriculture in the southwest and the west um, of the country. So the more that you bring in, let's say, rice and peanuts, for instance, at a cheap price, the fewer farmers are able to make a living and keep the internal economy going, the more it does create dependence. It's, It's a word that we're kind of sensitive to because it's it's typically used to put down Haitians like oh they're just becoming dependent on aid. Um, it's more like they're um, being made to become dependent on aid in our opinion. But um, because of you know the proliferation sorry of cheap rice for instance that's fortified, they are getting some synthetic micronutrients through there. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, people seem to be very low in phytonutrients in general. Um, low in minerals in particular. Um, and they tend to respond very well when some adjustments are made in their diet, when they add, for instance, amaranth um, to their diet. Uh, and moringa is another good source of phytonutrients and minerals. Um, their health actually improves quite well. So you're seeing more and more um, programs coming up to you know, grow moringa, for instance, and make sure it gets the people integrated into current malnutrition programs, et cetera. Hmm. There's a short film called Kombi, which is basically a term for a, 
like a collaborative farm or a collaborative community effort. Um, the film is about um, small-scale gardening that's going on in Siti Soleil, which is uh, an area near Port-au-Prince that was particularly hit hard by the earthquake and how they have helped to address malnutrition in their community by uh, community gardening and growing moringa. It's pretty fascinating. So apart from Haiti, what are the active sites of Naturopaths Without Borders? Because, I mean, it's sorely needed all around the world. Do you tend to sort of stick to lo- those sort of more local uh, locations to the US where you can quickly get to? Or do you spread to, to places like Africa, for instance, or indeed to Europe? There's a huge issue there with refugees and their health needs. Right. So we are, we are focused on long-term work. And we have not, um, we have not really ventured into disaster relief. It's just not really the model that we're pursuing. Yeah, gotcha. Um, that said, obviously in Haiti with with the hurricane, we did decide to help sponsor another organization and funnel some resources and funding, kind of small organizations. Um, but we are focusing more on the long term on the sustainability piece. So yeah, the other two active sites that we have going are the monthly trip to Mexico that's primarily staffed with student and physician volunteers from Arizona and San Diego, and then also the all-volunteer free clinic that we uh, assist with Phoenix Allies for Community Health in Phoenix. So uh, yeah, having follow-up, having sustainability and scalability are more important to us than going where there are disasters. And many other organizations that do that do a really great job and we're happy to support them and highlight their work. It's just not our area of expertise and we're, we're choosing to focus on the long term. But but this would require a massive amount of funding, particularly if you're providing free clinics. How's it funded? So it depends on the location. Yeah. Um, the good news is because we're using natural medicine, we're using a lot of education, we're using hands and inexpensive treatments like acupuncture needles and homeopathic remedies, we actually don't have you know, large medical costs compared to you know, if we had to buy a lot of medications, yep. uh, especially to try to you know, sustain people long term. So the, uh, the Haiti project is primarily kind of self-funded through the volunteers and through private donations to the organization itself. Um, the work in Phoenix is also all volunteer as well. And the work in Mexico is primarily organized and again, kind of self-funded by the fees of the volunteers that go down. So they get the experience, they get the learning, they're serving. Um, you know, and, and ultimately we get a lot of donations from supplement companies and distributors Mm. that make that piece of it better when we are doing that. Um, but for Haiti, for instance, it's a lot more educational focused, um, you know, partnering with other organizations and supporting what they do instead of us being the ones who are going in, running the clinic, seeing all the patients ourselves. Right. I've got to ask the question about if, if somebody from say Australia wanted to become involved in naturopaths without borders, particularly to get some, you know, experience in training, for instance, um, treating uh, people in a different way than what they're usually accustomed to in Australia. How would they get in contact with you? And indeed, what sort of issues do you face with, say, um, you know, licenses? Let's let's use the word licenses, to, a license to practice. Do you do you come up against challenges from outside? Um, for, it, forgive me for sourcing outside practitioners. Um, anyone who's going to be um, practicing is going to need to have a license. Now, the level to which you practice will will depend on in what capacity you're volunteering. So we understand there will be differences, and we've worked with the volunteers who are nurses, volunteers who are MDs or DOs or PAs. Um, and so you know, we find a healthy medium where they're comfortable, they're doing what they're trained to do, but they're also learning as well. Yep. Um, and, of course, we have students who are not yet license, but they are you know, under the supervision of one of our physicians, um, operating similarly to how they would in our student training clinics here in the United States. So um, ultimately it depends on the skill level and the licensing of the volunteer. Um, 
we do want our volunteers to be culturally competent, to have a good idea of how to approach the patient, either in Haiti, Mexico, or, or even in Phoenix with the populations with which we're working. And so we created some volunteer guides to help facilitate that process and also um, some documents that we call the clinical crash course for each of those sites that help people get up to speed on you know, the flow of the clinic and you know, the philosophy of the clinic, some different questions to ask, how people answer questions differently, some different cultural uh, conditions or diseases, if you will. And then what we do, again, to support the health of that person, um, you know, regardless of what resources they have available or what resources we have available. So it looks a bit different in each place where we work, mm. um, but those are available on our website, both the volunteer guides and the clinical crash courses, which is www.nwb.ngo. And so anybody who is interested in volunteering but not quite sure what that looks like or what they, you know, what what they might be doing or what they want to do, they can definitely contact us. We can have a discussion about it. We have had some potential Australian volunteers. We're definitely open to it. Um, even non-health volunteers. Um, you don't help we can get. So there are there are other things that we do aside from you know direct um, you know working with people in the community on a health level. There are other things that we're open to doing, and we're always looking to make connections, even if you know people don't necessarily come down and volunteer. Mm. Uh, what are the major challenges or hurdles that you you tend to face in an ongoing way um, to help deliver effective healthcare to these um, places? So many challenges. <laughs> so you know, where do I start? <laughs> you know, anyone. Number one, we're a nonprofit organization that you know is primarily volunteer driven. So you know, there's always um, you know, people are well meaning, but. Um, so sometimes people don't follow through, yeah. or sometimes you know the 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 skills that they think they're bringing to the table maybe um, are not what's really needed, and so um, sometimes there are other skills that we don't even know would be a good match until they actually come to volunteer, and it would be nice to have some more planning, for instance. But that's just kind of the magic of of you know nonprofits in the volunteering world is to get all kinds of people who come out of the woodwork with a variety of skills and um, the people who come back for a return trip will have a better idea of what's going on. They yeah. can more quickly be kind of dipped in. They already know you know how to talk to people. They already know our staff personally and and that's really great. Um, we we always have issues um, you know getting supplies down there that we want mm. and of course raising enough Know, funds to run everything optimally to continue growing. Um, you know, every organization is, is facing growing pains, especially you know, with economies going up and down. It, sometimes it's kind of uncertain. So we do our best. And um, I'd say another, another challenge in general is just outside trends. We get periods where there are many more volunteers interested. Maybe there's get some kind of disaster or something that's kind of driving people's attention toward a particular country. But when that dies down, then there's less interest and people yeah, yeah. Uh, might be moving on to the next thing. No, they're Again, they're well-intentioned. Um, and it's great that the news can kind of highlight some of the conditions that are going on in the world. But on the other hand, when the news is turned off, you know, 300,000 people still died in the earthquake. And there's <laughs> there was so much rebuilding for years. Wow. Um, there was a lot of grant money and aid money coming in then, but a couple of years later, it was so much harder to get funding mm. and, you know, to have interest in general. So, um, you know, the kind of the shifting sands of the world, um, you know, can be difficult to adjust to, honestly. Mm. Absolutely. I've got to ask then to, and this is, I'm going to include this to a call out to any company that might be okay. able to help Sean with Naturopaths Without Borders. What would be the top five supplements that you require on an ongoing basis? We always need essential fatty acids. Um, now we do our best when patients have access to, you know, say, purslin, which grows in Haiti and Mexico. 
um, you know, fish, obviously, but um, being able to give patients who are experiencing you know, more acute and chronic inflammatory states a boost of essential fatty acids is really helpful. Definitely multivitamins, both you know, prenatal nutrients and uh, kids' vitamins in general. Um, there's only so much you can do with a very limited diet, limited foods available to make mm. up for that. Mm. So we've done some vitamin distribution programs in the past. We'd like to continue doing that. Um, definitely magnesium, I would say, is probably a top five nutrient that we that we tend to give a lot of, um, as well as immune support and probiotics. So you know, similar, actually, you know, top five list to what a typical practitioner would say in the United States mm. um, is what we're tending to find there as well. And the way that people's Diseases kind of manifest might lead you to kind of treat them individually, but when you take a step back, you'll see, oh, actually, three things they have going on are indicating that they have magnesium deficiency, for instance, or that they have been taking um, a lot of antibiotics indiscriminately because um, you know, there's a lack of education about um, you know the proper use of antibiotics, and so they're getting. You know, GI and other inflammatory issues because they're lacking beneficial flora. So the ways that they are manifesting their you know, deficiencies, toxicity, stress, et cetera, can be a bit different, but they're still kind of the same core things that we're trying to boost. Yeah. You know, between people in the United States who have more access and people abroad who don't. So, so could I... Hopefully, I hope I'm not being too arrogant here, but if I could parcel those into three sort of broad areas, immune support, stress support, mm-hmm. and gut restoration, would that be the sort of, would you agree with that or differentiate? Um, those would be good. And then just just general base, um, you know, support. micro and macronutrient yep. supplementation as well. Yeah. And as a sidelong, I'm sorry because I can't shut up because I'm really interested in this. Is um, what 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 would be the top five? <laughs> what would be the top five foods that you'd need to supplement to an area to you know get them back on their feet? Because we we've got to always be aware that foods are the foundation for any sort of quote unquote naturopathic regime. Um, regimen that that supplements are supplementary; they're not mainamentary. So, what sort of foods do you require on an ongoing basis? So, we actually we actually try to stay away from um, supplementing kind of an outside food, with a couple of exceptions. So, acute childhood malnutrition is a case where we actually will intervene with a fortified um, peanut butter, actually that is very fat and protein dense um, in order to quickly get a child out of the ditch of severe malnutrition, whether it's quashier core or marasmus. Mm -hmm. Um, It's hard to do that in a very compromised gut uh, with a child who is underdeveloped because they're lacking protein and calories. It's hard to do that with just straight up food once they're already in the ditch, so to speak. Yeah. So that... Um, but even that is locally produced. Um, and the majority of the nutrients in the, the Plumpy Nut Medica Mamba formula um, are, are locally sourced as much as they can. Now, what we prefer to focus on is which foods that are currently available to them are maybe underutilized. Right. Um, or maybe they could be prepared in a different way. Um, or are there things that people aren't widely aware of? So the best example I have in Haiti um, is Moringa. So it is growing there. Um, both the, traditionally, they call it Dolise. There's even a Creole name for it. Um, and there are also some projects to actually grow more of it and then supplement it in the diet, maybe add it to malnutrition programs, um, or just make sure that people have access to it. Um, Amaranth is another good example. It's growing everywhere. It's very micronutrient dense. It's similar in my mind on a, on a mineral level to say nettles. Um, we'll typically in the United States prescribe nettles tea to somebody who just needs some more minerals. Mm-hmm. Um, so having people do amaranth 
Perslin, for instance, has a lot of oxalates, so we don't want patients constantly doing it, especially if they are at risk for kidney stones, for instance. Yeah. You know, if they're well hydrated, the EFAs are very helpful. Um, so sometimes we will you know, bring protein powder um, or some concentrated greens blends to help patients get an antioxidant boost or a protein boost um, you know, in order to help them get over the hump of the condition. But they're not long-term solutions, so we'd rather have patients you know, eating more of the vegetables that are available to them. Now, some of those foods are more expensive. Typically around the world, it's harder to get protein. Protein tends to be more expensive overall of the nutrients in the diet. So sometimes we have a discussion around uh, take soda, for instance. If you have a patient who's not getting enough protein, uh, they're, they're weak, they're underdeveloped, but they're drinking soda, we'll have the discussion about saving up the money from not drinking soda, yeah. getting more water, and then maybe getting an egg a day, for instance. Yep. You should have so much more nutritional, positive nutritional impact. You know, the EFAs, the choline from the egg yolk, you know, the protein from the egg white, some healthy fats, um, so much more nutritional impact than that bottle of soda, even though it tastes really good. <laughs> right? For a short period of time, but that's, yeah. You know, that's the problem. It's, that's, it's addictive, um, and, and ultimately it's just you know, crashing your adrenals and, and creating its own kind of chemical dependence and not nourishing the body compared to an egg. Um, you could get three eggs for the cost of a bottle of soda in Haiti. So that's just kind of an economic discussion of tying together what you're eating and what your health looks like yeah. um, and then giving kind of a vision of what's possible with even a few minor changes. And so with regards to the Moringa tree, like what sort of time are we expecting this to uh, have until you can get to fruition, if you like? Growing time, for instance. Uh, growing time. So uh, Moringa oleifera, um, also known as drumstick tree, is a very quick growing tree, um, almost, uh, well, an imperial measurement, almost a foot a month. Wow. <laughs> so... You know, a, wow. a tree can pretty much grow to, um, you know, in the right conditions, and it's a pretty hardy, hardy drought-resistant tree. Yeah, get to where you won't be able to reach the leaves anymore uh, in a little over a year, and then you can cut it down to about a meter, say, and then let it grow back. And the more you do that, the more it kind of bushes out instead of growing up. You can grow them. Uh, gosh, about a third of a meter apart, kind of on a grid. And so in a, a pretty small amount of space, you could even have a hundred of these that you're growing for leaves. Yeah. You can let some of them grow to be into a big tree for pods. Um, we don't really use the oil nutritionally um, so much as the, the ground up seed powder um, is a natural flocculent, meaning uh, if you have some dirty water, some turbid water, and you put a little bit of the powder on top of it, with the way it's charged, it actually binds to the solids in the water and sinks them. So it makes it easier to UV sanitize dirty water, say from a river, that you can then put, you know, in a bottle and sanitize it in the sun or with, you know, an ultraviolet light, for instance. Mm -hmm. Or just grow more moringa from those seeds. There's That's so many... Um, pods that are produced a year, you can you know, quickly grow your own. Yeah, self-sustaining crop. Wow. I had no idea. That's incredible. One foot per month. Yeah. My goodness. Yep. So there's something definitely to, to use, yeah. Yeah, it, it goes very quickly, very, very uh, dense nutrition yeah. as well. It's, it's a little bit bitter. It's kind of like a strong salad green. Yeah. Um, you can also powder it, but it's also fine, you know, fresh as it is because it's kind of bitter. It does kind of... Um, liver stimulating, you know, kind of a cola dog herb. I could talk to you uh, um, on a separate podcast regarding the actual herbal medicines that you've encountered. <laughs> Perhaps we'll um, we'll uh, entreat ourselves to a, a further podcast. <laughs> would you be willing to do that with us on FX Medicine? I would love it. That'd be awesome, Sean. Absolutely. So thank you so yeah. much for taking us through your your um, charitable work. I just think absolutely incredible and awesome what you're doing, and indeed what the Naturopaths Without Borders organisation are doing to bring health back to impoverished or devastated um, locations. It's not just Haiti. 
So I just, I really doff my hat for what you guys are doing. It's, it's really, really impressive. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And I'm, I'm happy to share a little kind of glimpse of, glimpse of our world. Um, you know, some of the exciting things that are happening there. You see so much despair on TV and in the news, but um, you know, ultimately it's, it's not really like that. Um, there's definitely you know, a lot going on, positive and negative, and we try to highlight more of the positive mm. and show the you know, amazing people that we work with on a daily basis and their resilience, um, you know, as well as try to highlight some of the causes of what's going on, for better or worse. So thank you for you know, giving us some space to, uh, to highlight some of that work. Oh, very well done. We'll get you back onto FX Medicine soon. Excellent. This is FX Medicine. And I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. FX Medicine is your gateway to news, resources and information on the safe, evidence-based approach to practising complementary and integrative medicine. Visit fxmedicine.com.au to sign up for e-news and stay up to date with the latest research, podcasts and industry information.